Hey everyone, a big welcome to the Forge Ahead Show, hosted by me, Nick Elston, inspirational speaker, creator of unique mental health engagement strategies, a transformational speaking coach, and a mentor to have in your corner. The Forge Ahead Show brings you the storytellers, the influencers, the people who have gone from adversity to excitement, forging something better, something beautiful, something powerful. So stay tuned. Dive in and be inspired by today's very special guest. Hey everyone and a big welcome back to the Forge Ahead show for the final episode of season two and what a guest, a huge guest in in every aspect, a huge guest in the wonderful Dan Adozi. Dan Adozi, welcome to the show. Nick, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I really appreciate this wonderful opportunity. And also, too, I'm excited to uh, speak with you and, and figure out where we're going to go with this conversation. And wherever it goes is wherever it goes. Exactly. And, and because there is no script, there's lots of rabbit holes we go down. And who knows where we're going to go with this. But for, first and foremost, I think our paths crossed for our mutual friend, Zoe Thompson, who was on the show yesterday. Um, and she introduced us. You were doing some great stuff around kind of like at the time it was a budding kind of motivational speaking career, uh, which you've done leaps and bangs with since as well. And we first met on a boat on a sunny day in Bristol. And I walked in, I looked around, and suddenly a big booming voice said, Nick Elston. And that was it. The rest, as they say, is history. Uh, you've since been along to my speaking academy and been one of my guest speakers, did an amazing job sharing your experience with them as well. But in case anybody hasn't heard of you, like who hasn't heard of you, um, tell everybody like who you are like right now and what, what you do. Um, before I even say anything, uh, Nick, uh, thanks so much for sharing that, that wonderful memory of yours. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, uh, from the first day we met and stuff. Um, and what do I do? What do I do? I mean, such a vague question. I, I answer this question, <laughs> or I get asked this question like almost every single day. What do I do? As in, it's so vague. Um, but I guess what they're really trying to ask is like, what is your occupation and what do you really get up to? So I guess I'll answer from that angle. But um, I, so I work with young people. I work with young people trying to help empower uh, their mindset, help them to kind of get, find that little bit of hope, that little bit of anchoring that they need in whatever they may be going through in their own personal life. And plus too, with the world, uh, with how, you know, we are today as a human species, um, it's like we don't have enough role models for young people. So just being that positive role model for them and and trying to help them to believe that they can achieve uh, whatever they want to put their mind to. Um, And the reason I do that is just because, you know, from my personal like experiences and stuff like that, um, well, I went through a lot enough of a struggle uh, growing up and stuff, but I say that those struggles often like help to find that resilience, that sense of um, the sense of grounding that was needed in order to be able to cope with certain situations and to be able to weather the storms or weather different storms on top of other storms. And I say that ever since those kind of early days and those moments, um, they have definitely helped me to find the stability that I need in, in now to this day. And that's the thing that I do is sharing personal experiences, whether sharing my personal life or sharing experiences in sport or even teaching, teaching basketball in a way that's not just relatable to sport, but also to life. Um, it's, it's about that kind of like area and the expertise that I choose to partake in. Love that. And there's so much commonality with kind of our, our messages. And like you said, it's that, as you know, that kind of the, the tagline that I use, that forging people using that adversity and those experiences that could could easily have defined you negatively for the rest of your days. And mm. you harness that and it's brought something better, something beautiful, something powerful, something that wouldn't have existed that you're going through your stuff in the first place. And, and I'm sure we'll come on to that shortly. I guess from a, a superficial point of view, that most people uh, who are watching this will recognize you as, as a, a long serving. Uh, former captain of Bristol Flyers basketball team that you've only very recently um, that kind of period of your life has come to an end. Um, what was the reality of being a professional sportsman? Because very often the the public see the gloss, don't they? And they see the the spun version. What was the reality of being 
uh, a professional sports person as you were? Oh, good question. What was the reality? Um, the reality is, yeah, it's a bit of a time commitment. It's a bit of like, you know, you have to be determined. You have to be dedicated. Um, and you also have to be, you have to be a professional as much as you can. And you have to be able to deal with certain situations. You have to understand how people work, how teams work. You got to know what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And sometimes, like, it's just about maneuvering around that um, intuitively. Uh, on, on a more, like, lucrative financial level, uh, basketball, in here, basketball here in England, depending on what team you play for, you know, you could be making X amount, which is solid enough, but then you could be making X amount, which... Therefore, some some guys on the team need to go find a second job, or if they're not one of the main players, um, yeah, if that's if they're not one of the main players, they'll have to go find a second job. Like I had a couple of teammates that was doing some PT and work on the side, along playing basketball because you know basketball wasn't paying paying them, well, wasn't paying them enough or whatever, or maybe they wasn't getting anything out of it. Um, and also too, like for me, I knew basketball wasn't always going to be a forever thing. Uh, and I, that, that was just a reality. Reality, Like, I thought uh, maybe I'll go play EuroLeague or go play somewhere in Europe. And I'm not saying I'm not turning down the options. I'm still kind of in that mm. space mentally wanting to go there from the physical point. But at the same time, for now, I knew I wasn't really fully satisfied and wasn't fully happy. So I almost feel like um, I was also being aware of where my energy was. My energy is more like in my business at the moment and trying to build that up, which is, again, mm. the self-employment stuff and trying to, um, yeah, create something that helps to empower people. Uh, but at the same time, like whilst my energy was in basketball, I, had, I wasn't fully satisfied. I wasn't feeling fulfilled with basketball as opposed to what I was doing on the side. So I just thought, OK, you know, I'm going to go in between the two. And I think my heart's more in what I do with young people as opposed to basketball. But it's not to say that I don't enjoy playing basketball and I don't find any fun. So um, mm. that was reality for me a little bit. That's great insight. Thank you. I think it also pays testament to the fact that both captains, obviously leadership is something that is just, well, it seems to come effortlessly to you. It seems to be a very natural thing to lead. But also what I, I really noticed was when you announced you were leaving from a press perspective, reading through the PR media reports, that the club was so complimentary of the work that you did behind the scenes with the younger players. And, and again, it really taps into to essentially what you're about in that kind of self-employed mindset that we're talking about now. Mm. You also speak a lot about kind of mental health and how does that link with, and I've asked kind of former um, professional sports people around this, but in reality, they were, they had distance between their professional career and where we were speaking at that point you are hot off of ending this stint with Bristol Flyers. How is that link between mental health and visibility as a professional sports person? Because it's very, it's like social media, isn't it? it it's, you're kind of there to be shot at in some ways if, if your performance dips or if, if you do something out of line. Has that ever been an experience for you or one of your team members? Uh, yeah, we've, we've had, <laughs> this is a bit uh, kind of off the record here, but yeah, we've had a couple instances over the last few years where, yeah, like, things kind of got a bit too intense, um, whether on the court or off the court. And some people have had to kind of step away from the game or whatever. Um, wow. I'm not going to share anybody else's experience, but I'll share mine for sure. Uh, I know for me, like this past season, this past season, I had to take a week break because I, there, was a, there was things outside of sport that were kind of um, in, like making me think about what, exactly who I am as a person or why I'm here and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and that obviously stems from something a bit more deeper than basketball. Uh, but however, like when it came to the moment, you know, in time, in, in terms of like dealing with vulnerability and dealing with your own emotions and your own like, you know, vicious thoughts sometimes um, it was like, it, it was about feeling, being a part of something or belonging or, feeling like, you know, you're cared about or someone does support you or whatever it is that you obviously needs in order for you to keep that emotional st stability. Um, however, like, because I almost felt like, based on, like, my past experiences, those missing emotions that were there, like, kind of came back haunted, kind of haunted, kind of taking this part. And 
I bear in mind, I know that these emotions are there, but sometimes when it, it, when you're in an environment where those emotions are, are, are re-triggered because of the lack of like communication or support, you're not feeling like you belong, you're not feeling like you're part of a family, when you're in, in that environment, it's like hard to kind of, what's the word I'm looking for, try and like bounce back from them. And mm. so at some point, um, all hell just broke loose. And I just literally had a kind of like an emotional breakdown during the season. I had to take a week off after that uh, in spite of other go of going through other things outside, not just in, like I said, not just in, in sport, like on the team, but also outside yeah. of basketball, which really became overwhelming. Um, but I knew, I, I always knew like, this is something that I'm very aware of. Is it easy? No, it's not. But however, it's about that resilience. It's the mindset. It's being in a good place as much as you can. That kind of keeps you away from not going too far or too too close to the edge. You know what I mean? So, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I can I absolutely get having had the real pleasure of hearing one of your your kind of keynote talks at one of my events. That I get why those things link so strongly, like you said, with your past, with your roots, with um. And for those who are very, very observant, you haven't got a broad Bristolian accent. So what actually what actually brought you, actually it was brought you back, wasn't it, to England in the end? Because actually, were you born here and then you went to the US and then came back? Yes. Would, that you, mind is sharing, would, you, would you mind sharing a little bit of your story with us as much as you wish to say? Yeah, yeah, of course. I don't mind. I don't mind. So, um, yeah, originally I was born here in London and uh, and born in South London in, North, in Greenwich and lived in South London for about, 10, 11 years, but moving back and forth between different countries and stuff. Um, and then moved to America when I was 11, 2004, uh, with my mom. And we went on a journey. And by bearing in mind, when we came to America, we came in on a three month, a 30 day or three month visa, one of the two. And uh, usually when we go to America, we have family members. So we have family members in New York, Texas, and, and Florida, but we didn't go to any one of those places. So um, when we initially arrived in Boston, Massachusetts, it was like, what are we doing here? You know, like as a kid, 11 years old, you just kind of going along with the flow, riding in, in, in the seat of uncertainty with no control, you know? Um, and it's like, okay, you know, you're just kind of trying to weather the storm and brace for what's about to happen. Anyway, uh, my mother and I, we moved to Las Vegas three days after landing in, in Boston. And after about, sorry, yeah, we went to Las Vegas. And after, uh, uh, after a week of being in Las Vegas, after staying in like an apartment with a random stranger, uh, we ended up becoming homeless. And from the moment or from the first day we became homeless, it was just like all hell broke loose for almost a whole year. Like we were, we were, we stayed in a shelter for about three months in Las Vegas. Um, and then we moved to Los Angeles, staying in another shelter. And then when we moved back to Las Vegas, uh, bear in mind, we, we went between Las Vegas and Los Angeles and we went back and forth for about a good seven, eight months or so. And um, yeah, between the two places, it was like sleeping in shelters, sleeping in streets, um, sleeping in random places, sleeping in, sleeping at bus stops, um, trying to, yeah, trying to basically survive. And there's a couple of times we came across um, like different areas. And one of the different areas that we came across was called Skid Row in Los Angeles, California. And what Skid Row is, if you, for your audience who hasn't heard of it, great. Um, it's basically a two to three mile radius in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. And basically this place is surrounded by poverty, uh, people who are homeless, people who are on substances, people with mental health issues who are dealing with their own emotional demons. Um, and it's almost like there's no hope, there's no inspiration, there's literally nothing there. And being exposed to this as 11, 12 year old kid or young person, it was like a life humbling moment. It was almost like the, 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 the barest, of lessons or the valuable lessons that you can that you can learn from these experiences that would help you to not want to be here again you know what i mean so mm -hmm. um yeah and it was it was it was so that was that was back and forth between las vegas and los angeles and then we attempted to go to florida uh and and we tried to go on a bus on the greyhound 
like National Express in comparison to England. And we went from Los Angeles in an attempt to get to Florida, got stopped in Texas by immigration. And when we got stopped in Texas by immigration, um, basically they sent us back to a city in Texas called El Paso, stayed there for about four weeks, saw an immigration officer, and, uh, and they said basically we were no longer allowed to be in the country, but they didn't send us right back uh, after that meeting. Uh, I guess almost, it's almost like they just gave us a chance. And so uh, it was a thing where it was like, well, what do we do next? You know, as, as, as a 12 year old kid, ask my mom, where do we go? And she doesn't have the answers. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, how do we deal with this? So uh, basically we ended up going back to Los Angeles and being back at square one really, and really experiencing everything all over again from homelessness to sleeping on the streets. There was a couple of nights where I went, I went, I, I, was, I wasn't I was with my mom at all. Like I wasn't sleeping on a bus or a train somewhere, um, sleeping in random places and all that and whatnot. And I remember the only, the only suitcase, my suitcase was 150 to 200 gallon trash bag. And I kid you not, like, it was, right. it was, it was like, that was, that was my life at the time. And so, um, it, where, so where things changed was when I had just came from being back on the train all night and I met up with my mom in downtown Los Angeles and, uh, in, in the shelter where we was, where we used to stay, which is called Ununion Rescue Mission. And, uh, we left kind of maybe two-ish, three-ish in the afternoon and, uh, as we were as we were walking towards where my mom wanted to go, uh, we passed a shelter that was serving food at the time. And I asked my mom, "Mom, can we go in here and get some food?" And she said no. And so she kept walking. So I remember coming to a stop, and uh, I remember I remember you know thinking about this decision that I have to seriously make. You know, do I keep going down this path with my mom, or do I just go in here and get some food and come back out and deal with whatever happens next? And uh, I remember making that later decision of just going into the shelter and my mom never came around or never turned around to see where I was or nothing. She just kept walking forward. So um, I go into the shelter, get some food. 20 minutes later, literally, my life is at rock bottom uh, with this trash bag off my back. No money, no phone, no bus pass, no nothing. Like literally at the point of rock bottom. And um the only one thing I remember was, well, let's just go on this adventure and just see what happens. And I remember making a ride out the shelter and then making a left down the main street. And uh, I remember getting to a corner and what I see next is completely unbelievable. And I see that my mom is on the bus heading to where she wanted to go to. So um, it's, it's, it's a one way street and all the cars are going left and buses are going left. So I'm on this corner and I see that there's a bus stop to the left of me, a little bit further on down the street. And I'm thinking, okay, do I get off the bus? I mean, is my mom going to get off the bus? Or do I run to the bus trying to figure out what to do next? But instead, here's what happens. So I stood there on this corner and the bus got to the bus stop, saw no sign of my mom, and the bus kept going. So I stood there on the corner, watching this bus go, watching this bus go to the point where I couldn't see it anymore. And at that point, my mom wasn't coming back. So I'm standing here on this corner and I'm assessing this environment. And, and, and it's one of those choices where, you know, I'm in this environment where like, there's no inspiration, there's no hope, it's dangerous, you know, anything can happen. You got people that's battling with mental health issues, substance, substance abuse, people have given up on life, whatever. And it was like, Dang, like, do I sleep here on these streets tonight or do I go find a shelter? And do I go find somewhere that, where I feel a bit more safer? And um, yeah, I, 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 was, I, was, I was damn, I was surely not going to sleep on those streets tonight. Something just told me not to. And so, um, yeah, I felt a bit, it was a bit like, I wouldn't say it was overwhelming because it was like, okay, it was just about figuring out, finding the solution. And yeah, you know, you have your emotions that are probably there, but at the same time, it's like, well, trust what's in your heart and let's go find something that is most appro appropriate and, accom and accommodating for the situation I'm in. So basically I went on a search to find a shelter, 
all three shelters that I searched, um, that I asked for some help from, they turned me away because I was under the age of 18. However, it was that third shelter that said, you know, you know, we're not going to give up on you. Um, and they didn't give up because they asked some questions like, well, where's your mom? Where are you staying? What's just happened? And I just, well, basically I told them what had happened and they said that you shouldn't be here. And so they ended up uh, find, trying to find some support, came up a little bit short, but they called the police. Police came and picked me up, went on the search for my mom, can't find her. And I'm in a police station um, sitting there for about five hours in, in this space of like uncertainty again, like, but what's going to happen? You know, I'm no, I know I'm deported and my mom isn't here. And literally, it's like, literally, literally never felt so, what's the word I'm looking for? I never felt like I never have existed. I never existed in that moment. Like, you know, when you just feel like you just don't exist, like that's what it felt like being in the moment, right? And so, um, and so five hours later, uh, a random guy comes up. And, and, and coming to find out he's a social worker uh, for what the D, D, D Department of Family Services, social worker, something like that. And uh, yeah, he comes and talks to me and he, he says, come, al come along with me and got in his car. And basically we had a conversation coming to find out uh, I'm in a foster care system now. And so when I heard these words, it was like, Dang, like my life, I just went from this to now this, you know, and I didn't know whether to be, I didn't know how to feel because I was just, yeah, just, I, I was caught in the emotion of just trying to survive that now life is taking a bit of a different change. And it's like, well, how do I take this? And so, um, yeah, got in the foster care system and stayed in there for six years or so, only moved home once. Uh, my mom got deported back to the UK, unfortunately. And because, well, basically she tried to turn herself in to try and get me back. That didn't work uh, and immediately backfired. And, and so I remember, uh, so I just basically stayed in America without seeing my mom for about eight years or so. It's eight years? Nine, nine, eight, eight years, nine years or so. And um, yeah, started playing sports, having a bit more stability, being a bit more grateful for life and everything that I've been given now. Um, and yeah, it's just about taking off from there and just taking advantage of where life has put me now. So, uh, yeah, and that's how I, and, and going through the whole journey, you know, playing basketball in America, going through university life and all that, then playing professionally, then representing Team England and all that stuff. Um, and coming yeah, to I was gonna mention that actually, oh, personally, like, wow, 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 thank you <laughs> so much for sharing that with such like clarity. And it's it's truly humbling to, to see. It has to be said, especially a man to drop the guard enough to share that. So thank you. No um, way. Sorry, I don't want to keep on going, you know. Just... <laughs> no, on, honestly, you can keep going forever. We'll just keep this episode going for, forever. Um, but you joined Bristol Farts in 2015 from Iowa State University. Is that right? Yes. How, how, did, that, how did that move come about? How did that move come about? So it was after I finished university, there was a basketball tournament that took place in Las Vegas. And so I went. And the team that I played for, um, who was a coach, the coach for the team, or yeah, the coach for the team that I was playing for knew the head coach for Bristol. And he had put me in touch. And um, yeah, he put me in touch with the head coach for Bristol. And it was like, we was talking a little bit. And it also during this time, what really inspired and motivated me to keep on, to, to come to Bristol was the fact that I had a sister, never met her before. But I'm, I, I, have, I was having some FaceTime chat with her on, 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 in university and stuff. And um, coming to find out, she's, she lives in Bath. And so Bristol was literally up the street from Bath. And I was like, that's a perfect opportunity. Like, you know what I mean? Like, let's take that. So, um, and I told him if the opportunity came up to play in England, I would, I would take it. Um, and not just, not just for my sister, but also my brother who's in London and then also my mom who I haven't seen in ages um, and stuff. So yeah, that's what's really, that's what really made me kind of like come to Bristol. Wow, it's a true homecoming in a lot of ways. Then. That <laughs> yeah. re reconnection as well as obviously the new beginnings. You, as you just alluded to, you went on to represent England at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Yes. What an experience that must have been. Yeah, it was it was it was good. It was a really good, solid experience. Um, and I would do anything to do it again. Honestly, I would. 
Uh, and it was, it was a, it was almost like the cherry on the top of everything from where yeah. I first started, you know, to then now where I'm at, it's like, man, like grew up not being surrounded by no opportunities, like none, 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 so none whatsoever. But I definitely would say that going through those experiences, whatever, made me hungry to try and turn things around and try and make things better. And um, yeah, but, and, but staying on that track is what's, what led me to get into the opportunity to play for England. So, um, and it was a great experience being out in Australia, uh, playing against other teams from other countries and stuff like that. Got a chance to play against some former NBA players, um, which, is, which is quite unique and sick. Um, and yeah, got a chance to really just do something different and represent England in such a way, you know? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you signed off your Bristol Flyers career on a high as well because you reached the first ever cup final for them as well. So, uh, so much achievement. And you're, what, you're 28 now? Is that right? You're only 28 now. Yeah, that is correct. As a 43 year old, it's absolutely sickening. Not joking. <laughs> you still, hey, listen, you, you've achieved a lot in your own personal life as well. So don't, you know what I mean? You, you, we all, we all achieving. And that's, that's, that's look at that. If you wasn't, if you wasn't achieving, then you wouldn't be where you are now. So, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. Well, I, I jest, but I love the work that you do. Uh, I love the focus you have with young adults and stuff. So, I guess, what are you hearing from, from audiences and young adults and children and stuff? Um, in your space right now around like mental health and confidence and, and how things like the pandemic and lockdowns affected them? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's loads of stories out there for young people, uh, young like, that in which young people are going through. And uh, one of them is that, you know, being at home, you know, whatever they was exposed to whilst they was away from home when they came, uh, now in being in lockdown or just being in lockdown and stuff, um, now there's exposed to it so much more. And you could just imagine like some of the domestic violence or substance abuse, whatever that parents are, you'd be surprised. We are in 2021 and there are parents that are still not getting it. Like still not understanding how certain things that they're doing is actually inflicting trauma or on, on young people and young people having to come into schools and deal with this sort of like emotional pain or this sort of emotional residue. And um, it, it has an effect on their mood and how they perceive things, how they feel about themselves. You know, there's some, ki there's some kids that, that don't feel worthy or there's some kids that don't have enough confidence, have low self-esteem issues or, 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 or dealing with like how they view themselves because all they really, where they really learn these things from is at home and what's going on at home isn't really, it doesn't really have a healthy environment. And so... It's, it's, it's about how do you give, how, how do you introduce young people to new ways of thinking so that way they can feel better, not, not, they can feel better about themselves and not just for the environment that they're in. Yeah. And, you know, obviously sharing my personal experiences, like I know I was in, when I was in environments and, and, and these environments had absolutely zero worth it was like, how do you emotionally stay grounded and just get through it and just keep, continue to keep on trying to believe, at least continue to look for something positive, look for something that is hopeful. Don't look, yeah. don't, don't look for those sources of information that continue to keep you in a state of emotion. So if basically what I'm saying is if you're surrounded in an environment where it is chaos, don't be looking for more chaos outside of the chaos that you're already in. That's not going to help you get into a better space instead of looking instead of looking for sources of chaos look for sources of positivity love some something that kind of helps you to keep a positive mindset or a positive mind frame um so that way you know you're not you're not feeling as bad as what your situation is making you feel um and some some of it is easy some of it is some kids get it some kids not like there's kids that are dealing with like anger issues because you know their parents don't want them or their parents are literally like just rejecting them constantly, constantly, constantly. To then now they begin to like really think that they're not, they don't mean nothing to this planet or they don't mean nothing to humanity and whatnot. Um, and yeah, it's it's like getting getting kids to understand. Hold on, wait a minute. You are worth something. You know, don't let someone who's brought you into this world 
make you feel like you're not worth anything. Like that's not that's not you. Sometimes that's just them, how they feel about themselves in which they're projecting that emotion onto you. And the, your job or your challenge is to break that cycle and say, you know what? No, wait a minute. I am worth something and I'm not going to let you tell me that I'm not. And then once you ch- kind of change that, then, hey, maybe it might click for the parents to understand that my parenting and the way I've been treating my children or my child has been the best. So I'm going to try and put my best foot forward to change that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think so, we're, we're both subscribers to, in life, we either own our story or our story can own us. It would have very easily, what you shared with us today, it could have easily taken you down. It could have easily destroyed you. Now, I know from personal experience of sharing your own emotional story, it can take a lot of us as well, take a lot of our energy. Um, if we're immersed in a situation where you're having conversations with audiences or students or clients, or whatever that looks like for you, your default setting is you're a good guy. You want to help as many people as possible, but sometimes that can really take it out of us. We become, my counselor calls it a, a wounded healer. We be- become a wounded healer. We give and give and give and give without that self-protection. How do you protect yourself and your own emotional well-being when you're doing your thing? Um, how do you do it? You, you, you learn how to not really tune into tune into how someone is feeling with their emotions. Like you kind of disconnect from your emotions. I guess it's called, through NLP, it's called dissociation. And Mm -hmm. so you don't use your emotions to, you you understand the emotions, but you don't allow your emotions to get involved because if you do, then that's where you can kind of lose a bit of control. You could become a bit out of balance. And so, um, yeah, what you essentially do is just you, 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 you take, you empathize with them, sympathize with them, you feel for it. You, you understand, okay, yeah, it may be shit, or excuse me, pardon my French. It may no, you're all good. <laughs> we've, got, we've got an explicit rating, so we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can cut that one out if you like. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, 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 understand, okay, the situation may be tough. It may not be the best. It might not be what you like for it to be. Um, but then you also understand the psychology and how humans think and stuff and young, how young people think as well. Um, you kind of walk them from point A to point B without you really necessarily getting involved. So it's like, you kind of, yeah, you disassociate yourself, but you kind of get them to think about it from different points of view. Um, you know, without, yeah, without you really being involved, like you're just leading the way and that way and that and that's probably the best way that I say in order as to how to lead people. Again, like you said earlier, it's like natural kind of leadership. It is absolutely. But you cover some. Let's face it. You cover some big themes. You cover some heavy themes, and potentially that they could be themes that could be quite triggering to people going through those experiences. How do you make your content age appropriate? Um, because in reality, if it's kind of like the work that I do in the space, is that it's the same drive, it's the same theme but the way that you deliver it is in obviously in a way that that would be more relatable to that age of audience it would be in a basketball club or a construction Mm. site or a boardroom um how do you make your content kind of age appropriate so that you can take them on that journey without necessarily throwing in everything you see what i mean how do you make it age appropriate ah you just gotta be flexible you gotta be you gotta be flexible you gotta understand that yeah, there's different ways of communication. Like, you know, young people, like they want something more funly, more vibrant. And if you could bring a heavy theme and put it in a way that makes it edible for them, then they will buy more into it. Um, whereas as opposed to adults, it's like, okay, we all understand. We're all old enough. We're, we should be a bit more developed. So we could take on, you know, heavy themes because we have a bit more maturity uh, about ourselves. Or at least we want to say we have a bit more maturity. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure, so, yeah, they absolutely. Are, they uh, are, thank good. you. Good. So, uh, the question uh, I, I guess I want to ask, we kind of touched on this right at the beginning, was what's next for Dana Dozy? Obviously that you do some great work and, and all the links to Dan's content and website and socials are in the, in the bio. Please do check out and subscribe and follow and speak to him and everything else. Um, but what is next? Like I said, you, you haven't ruled out professional sport, uh, professional basketball playing ongoing. But right now, you're in that kind of fluid period. You're just seeing what stuff lands. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's it really. Just explore, explore. Um, I know my heart's really set on motivational speaking. And once September, September comes after coming back from, you know, whatever I do in August, I think that's where my bread and butter is going to be, working in schools, um, delivering programs, literally seriously working with young people now, a little bit, for a little bit of time, see how it turns out for a whole year. And yeah, just really building, just building for long term um, and building, building something that's going to help, you know, the next 20, 30 years, um, you know, like building a business or trying to trying to help grow basketball here in Bristol, um, even around the UK possibly. And yeah, really just 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 see where my heart goes. Nice. Yeah, I love that. See where your heart goes. Absolutely. So I look forward to sharing a stage with you very soon then. That'd be really yeah. cool. <laughs> so oh, yeah, that'd be amazing. I, that would be really cool. So um the question that I ask everybody that comes on the show is I set the scene. I'm now the MC of the O2 Arena in London. 20,000 people have paid their hard-earned money to come and hear you do your thing, your motivational talks. I'm just about to announce you to the stage and your walk-on music kicks in, that one song that you would walk on to that raises your game, that puts you at peak state, that gets your energy in the right place. What would that track be? What would that track be? Wow, this is an off-guard question. <laughs> Catch me off guard, put me on the spot. Uh, what song? What song? What song? Uh, what song? Oh my god! Oh my god! What have I been getting into recently? Um, I've, I think "Finding My Way Home" by Sammy Virgie. Him, nice. Have you heard that song? Uh, yeah, yeah. Play- Actually, it's been on the suggested playlist for one of my speaking academy events. Love that. That's amazing. Oh, Great really? choice. And yeah, absolutely. I get that completely. So Dan's choice, along with every other choice from every guest on season two, will be on a playlist of music that's going to be available very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. But for now, Dan and Dozy, thank you so much for being on the show. You've been an amazing guest. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Have, thanks for having me on here, Nick. Really appreciate the time. Perfect opportunity. And hope your audience uh, got something from this whole um, speaking show. So and yeah, they can take something and they can walk away with it, think in a different way. That's it. I'm, I'm 100% convinced that they would have. And I have as well. So thank you very much. So thanks to Dan again. And for everybody else, this is it. It's a wrap. Season two is now done. Season three uh, may look a little different, but it will be back from the 1st of October onwards. We're going to take a little break for summer. As Dan said, we all need that kind of step back sometimes. So I'm taking a step back to revamp. But season three will be coming along very shortly. So stay tuned. Stay subscribed and uh, stay well and be happy. Uh, Enjoy the sunshine and take care. I'll see you soon. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. A big thank you for tuning in to today's show. Please stay tuned and hit subscribe for future episodes, bringing you amazing guests, sharing amazing content and amazing insights. Really excited to bring you these. The Forge Ahead Show is sponsored by NickElston.com. If you want to connect with me, you can find all the ways possible through the website. If you want to drop me a message, always great to hear from you. But in the meantime, if I don't catch you before, I'll see you at the next episode. And you take care, guys. Cheers now. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.